So you're well, very welcome everybody and thank you for the introduction Orla. We have a great panel here today to discuss research culture and environment. We have Abeba Burhan, who's a PhD student in cognitive science in UCD computer science in Lero, and her work is on bias in artificial intelligence. She's also currently an intern at DeepMind. We also have Cormac Taylor, who uh, is well known to many of you as a full professor in the UCD School of Medicine, an eminent researcher in the area of gene expression and hypoxia, and also a recipient of the UCD of the Nature Mentorship Award, beg your pardon, in 2014. Finally, we have Maria Bagramian, who's Professor of American Philosophy in UCD, and she is coordinator and leader of the Peritia project, which is about trust in experts. So I'd like to start off our panel discussion today with you, Abeba, and I will uh, ask you first about the culture and environment of a university. And we know that this has a huge influence on the success of its people. Can you discuss how you think systems that are ostensibly designed to be neutral can contain biases that can marginalize individuals and groups, and what can be done to address this? Thank you, Grace. Hi, everyone. It's uh, nice to be here on this panel uh, with everybody else. Uh, yes, uh, uh, culture and environments do influence, uh, that is, that's an obvious fact, uh, do influence research excellence. Uh, and uh, environments and ecology that seems neutral or that seems you know, just normal for some uh, is in fact othering for or uncomfortable for others. Uh, and my go-to great example is from Sarah Ahmed, one of my favorite uh, feminist, uh, black feminist scholars. Uh, she describes how an environment that seems neutral or comfortable for others might be otherwise for other people. So she gives an example of imagine you are, uh, you know, a, pro, a senior professor that has been in uh, holding an academic position for, say, over 30 years. Uh, you go into your office, you have your nice couch, you go sit on it and you do your work every day. Uh, and then over the years, over time, that couch kind of takes you, the shape of your body and it's so comfortable for you. And someone else comes and sits down at that couch and says, this couch is uncomfortable. It's really difficult for you to see or to understand how, you know, that could be otherwise. So, you know, spaces that we find that, that some people find comfortable are you know, we have to constantly question whose couch is it we are sitting on. And uh, the academic hierarchy is really built on power asymmetries and, and these, uh, you know, difficult dynamics. We have, you know, society has this idea of what an intellectual looks like, who is capable of doing excellent research and, and all those. So these are, uh, if you don't fit that stereotype, that you know imagined or constructed vision of what an intellectual looks like you know if the environment doesn't provide that it's going to be really difficult for those that don't fit uh, you know certain stereotypes and the environment can be changed gradually uh, so for example in ucd and in dcu i know for a fact uh, that there has been a campaign to put uh, women on walls um, uh, I know also in the School of Philosophy, Maria Bagramin here has tried to, uh, to, to make uh, the philosophy department much more welcoming by putting up posters of women philosophers. That I've, I myself found that really helpful when I was doing my studies there uh, with Maria. Uh, so this gradual change, the step by step, changing the ecology, changing the environment, but not just you know, a shallow change, uh, but also a uh, real change of the, the ecology and the environment uh, is, uh, is important to welcoming all these uh, uh, kind of cast out uh, images or voices. 
Very good. And Abeba, can you just tell us now, as somebody who is doing a PhD in an academic institution, but also interning in DeepMind, are there differences you would like to point out between academic, academic research and research in a non-academic environment? Uh, I, as uh, as as an intern at DeepMind, uh, a lot of what uh, you know DeepMind, any tech industry does, is uh, private and confidential. So uh, I will not be able to disclose that much. Uh, but uh, I can say that you know when you are uh, a certain identity, when you embody a certain embodiment, whether it's academia or industry when there is a, a socially formed stereotype, wherever you go, there will, there always are, uh, uh, you know, very nuanced, you know, in, in, seemingly invisible to other people, but not to me, uh, ways of, uh, ways that you realize you don't fit there or you are not welcome or you don't fit a, a certain type of, you know, a researcher or, or an intellectual. So those do exist in, in both environments. Okay. Thanks very much, Abeba. And I'll pass now perhaps to Cormac. And Cormac, we know that mentorship can have a huge influence on the development of researchers and how they can succeed or lack or uh, not succeed in their career. And we've been uh, focusing on mentorship very much in the re UCD research strategy. And clearly you're somebody who has enormous skills as a mentor being the recipient of the Nature Mentorship Award. So how would you argue that our universities and our academic institutions should do to enhance mentorship and improve the research culture as a result? Thanks, thanks, Grace. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I, I'll cut, cut to the chase, first of all, in, in terms of your, your first point, I do believe mentorship is hugely important, uh, both for the uh, integrity and the reputation and the legacy of the, uh, of the university and uh, of us as individual academics. So uh, whether it be the mentorship of undergraduate students, postgraduates, postdoctoral fellows, or indeed peers within the faculty, uh, um, uh, I think that uh, an effective uh, environment which promotes and supports uh, a high degree of mentorship is is really important um, you know on an individual basis uh, and maybe you get to a certain age you start to realize that in fact your greatest legacy is going to be not the papers you publish or the or the or the grants you get or the books you write but the people that you train um, and I really truly believe that uh, um, uh, mentorship is, is really a great privilege but also a great opportunity for you to uh, to do high quality work um I, I would like to say at the outset as well that i think the uh, diversity and including uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, inputs into research environment is hugely a, a, a huge contributor to uh, to mentorship um, as as is alluded to earlier on um uh, by abeba um and I do think it's really important to remember that your the legacy, the people that you mentor, uh, will last far beyond the funding cycle of a grant or or the lifespan as, of a paper or a book. So um, I think if we can um, if we can communicate that, particularly to young faculty who are coming in and taking on research positions, um, give them the, the the wisdom of age and tell them in thirty or forty years this is what's going to matter. Uh, then I think we can. Uh, we, we can start to change this culture where mentorship is more more appreciated because I do believe that it is one of the most underrated qualities in research. Uh, we talk about people's, uh, uh, in, it's almost inverse, the amount of money people bring in is the most important to what they publish is second important and, and, uh, and secondary importance and, and the people they mentor seem, the mentorship role seems to be uh, really, in my opinion, underrated. Um, because I, I would consider mentorship to be one of the greatest privileges that I've had in, in terms of, of getting, being lucky enough to get a, an academic position. Um, particularly, I think about postgraduate students and postdocs who, who really give up three to four to five years of their, their, their lives to be mentored by, by uh, you as an individual. So I think that uh, uh, underlies the solemn responsibility that we should all take on. And it's about the person, it's about the mentee, it's not about the, the CV of the mentor, uh, as it were. Um, I will say just a one final point, and that is that uh, we talk in the age of COVID about contagious things. Uh, good mentorship is highly, it's probably the most contagious condition known to man. Um, second, possibly only to bad mentorship. So I think, uh, uh, I think it's important to remember that if we in 
grain a culture of good mentorship in the university, it will pay and pay and pay and keep paying. If we don't, we run the opposite risk of a decaying culture where mentorship is not valued. And I know Cormac, you said it's contagious, but are there specific things we could do to really encourage people to be good mentors? So we're all used to peer review and experts reviewing our applications and papers. But what about the idea of 360 review? So the mentees would evaluate how good their mentors were at supporting them. Is that something you think would be useful? Well, absolutely, yes. I, I would fully agree with that. I think that the reputation of a, a individual academic, a senior academic who has um, uh, uh, responsibility for uh, postgraduate students, meant, uh, uh, postdoctoral fellows, but also uh, uh, faculty, um, uh, should be subject to review by those people. They are the people who know best how somebody is performing, and I don't think any academic should be afraid of receiving that that information. Um, I think it's it's kind of strange in some ways that, uh, and I think particularly in terms of research leadership, you know, you need a license to own a dog in this country, but you don't need a license to train a PhD student to give four years of their lives to you. So I think that the actual training of young uh, uh, faculty is really important. UCD is quite unique in this in that it runs a program for uh, training new uh, faculty uh, in the, so I'll use the word art, but in the in the, the skill, if you like, of, of research mentorship. And I think that that that's a really important way to to change the culture a little bit. I'm not a huge fan of, although as you said, I did receive one, which was lovely to, uh, to receive an award. Um, but I think awards can be quite isolating. Lots of people mentor in different ways, and um, it's a difficult thing to measure in terms of um, uh, awards. Uh, but I think it's something that we can reward, if you like, in the promotion process. So uh, I think that that we need to develop ways. And you gave a very good example of it there with the 360. Uh, evaluations uh, to evaluate people's mentorship skills uh, and contributions and give them value and promote people who are demonstrating good mentorship. Uh, but we also need to identify uh, people who are not doing mentor, uh, doing a high quality mentoring and help them and train them. It is something that can be uh, to some to some degree uh, trained. Um, and, and one of the things finally that I would do, and this might come up later on in the discussion as well, is I think we need to maybe change the focus of what we um, what we value as high quality research or, or broaden the focus. And it's not just about income and grants that are accumulated. Um, it's, it's more about the outputs that go from that grant. And I include very much the trainees and the mentees that, that evolve out of a research program that really shows a, a true class and excellence and will be, as I've said, vital to the uh, legacy uh, of the university as well as its reputation. Fantastic, really powerful stuff there and thoughts, uh, Cormac, thanks so much for that. I move now to Maria. And Maria, we know that modern research often requires collaboration internationally and large groups of people to work together. And um, we also know that it's very important that the public trusts our research and that trusts uh, in experts is, is a big topic, for example, during the, the pandemic. How do you think our research culture and trust within research teams and between researchers affects how the public perceives the trustworthiness of our research? Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this panel. And I must, I must start by saying how much I agree with everything that has been said, both, both the climate of diversity and equality and also the need for mentorship. Uh, when it comes to trust, there are well-known markers for trust and trustworthiness in research. Uh, track record of genuine expertise established through peer-reviewed and other kinds of prestigious pu publications, indications of esteem among peers, reputation in general in, in academic circles. Uh, these are well-established markers, but in addition, there are these epistemic and moral values that go into making for a good and trustworthy researcher. Values such as transparency, such as in honesty, integrity, truthfulness, showing that one's research is not colored by one's political or personal interest. These must markers of trustworthiness, both in terms of expertise and the moral and epistemic values apply 
to researchers when they are collaborating with each other, and also for the need to have the public's trust in uh, conducting our research. Universities and the researchers who work in these universities should be aware of both sets of values. Our trustworthiness is not established only because of our publication records, but also additional factors, such as our attempts to show that we have integrity and honesty and transparency through openness and accountability. In uh, my own research project, Peritia, we talk a lot about establishing a climate of trust a climate of trust, not just in politics or in banking or in media, but also in research and among scientists. So one essential element of that climate of trust is to show that we have goodwill towards those who we expect to trust us. Uh, so in case of universities, it's the general public, the students, the younger researchers who we are mentoring, uh, uh, as well as the politicians or uh, the civil servants who we might wish to influence in terms of our expert advice. So goodwill is a marker of trustworthiness that applies not only in research among uh, re the scientists working together, but also and maybe more importantly towards the general public. Thank you very much, Maria. Again, profound thoughts there. I'm going to ask each of you in turn now to respond uh, succinctly, if you can, to a question which keeps me up at night sometimes. And that's, we know that research by its nature is a very competitive process. We're competing for funding, for publications. We are under scrutiny and so on uh, for our research results. But we know also, as we've rehearsed here today, that collegiality is also really important among research communities and a spirit of positive mentorship, con good constructive criticism and development of the next generation. Do you think that we have an appropriate balance at the moment in our research ecosystem between competition and collegiality? How can we synergize those two? And is the one thing you can suggest uh, for any part of the research ecosystem, and I'm talking here about the funders, the uh, publishers, the organizations, the individuals that could maybe optimize that balance. So no pressure now, but maybe we'll go to Cormac and then Abeba and then Maria to talk about that. Yeah, okay, well, I'll be as succinct as possible, Grace, as you said. Um, uh, I think that, um, as I mentioned earlier, we need to broaden our definition of high quality research to include uh, more difficult things to measure, such as the impact of work in terms of academic um, uh, citations, for example. I think in some ways we can return to some of the more traditional uses, uses of, of, of valuing academic research in terms of not just the impact factor of the journal in which we publish our work, which I do not think is a great measure of, of quality, but the number of times a paper is cited. Because the reality is it sometimes takes yeah. years or even decades before we know the true impact of research. Um, and we, we, we like to think of it a little bit too much, I think, in terms of the quick fix, which is the economically measurable fix. So I think that that, that, that is important. Um, uh, I think if we can communicate to our people uh, through mentorship, I would say, and I, I really truly believe what I'm going to say now, and, and it's absolutely something that I think we need to communicate, particularly to younger faculty who've grown up in this really comp intensely competitive environment, that that is that as an institution, there's not a limited number of good things that can happen. Uh, uh, um, and in fact, it's the opposite. If good things happen to your colleagues, it tends to raise the, it, it's the tide that raises all boats. So if we can communicate that message, I think we'd, we'd make a great improvement. Very good. Thanks, Cormac. And Abeba, in one minute, what can we, one thing we can do to enhance I, regionality? Yes, I just want to second everything Cormac said, and I will just add one line. When I started the PhD, someone said to me, everyone is here is smart, but be different by being kind. So we have smart everywhere. We have enough smart. We need to focus more on kindness, on compassion, and all the other features that Cormac was uh, pointing out that are really difficult to measure. Absolutely. And if we can be kind as well as smart, how much better our research would go. So I think we should definitely all hold that thought uh, today. And Maria, the final word goes to you. 
So I, I, I think uh, co competition for scarce resources is an inevitable feature of our research lives. So we need to accept that. But at the same time, remember and accept that collaborative research has proven to be extremely useful. And in order to collaborate, we need to work with our colleagues to be open to new ideas, to their perspectives, as well as to our own, and uh, to, to be pluralistic in our approaches. And once we accept that fact of collaboration, then competitiveness loses its sting. And I like to add two more factors at individual level. One is intellectual humility. And the other one is to try and accept our fallibility as researchers. Every truth that we come up with in a hundred years or so, as my favorite philosopher Hilary Potter said, is going to be proven to be wrong. So we are just going to be able to come up with the best ideas now, not the last word. And reminding ourselves of this humbleness in intellectual matters, I think can help to make us better researchers as well as better human beings. Thank you very much, Maria. So with that, those three thoughts then about intellectual humility, kindness, and the key importance of mentorship, I think we'll conclude today's discussion and I'll hand you back now to Orla. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you.